Matthew's gospel records that Jesus invited all who are weary to come to him just as we are. When we accept his call to come, we find true freedom. So again, take your Bibles if you've got them and turn again to Matthew, uh, this time from verse 20 to the end of the chapter. So Matthew 11, verse 20. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What does it mean to be in Christ? The Bible makes it plain that only those who have become God's children by grace through faith have been placed into Christ. Now ask yourself that question. Does that phrase reply to me? You may be young or more mature, more mature in age. You may come from a good Christian family and you paid attention to what most that they've, they, they've told you through your, your life. We all come here today from a variety of backgrounds, many not religious. But here this morning, you need to ask yourself this question. Can I have my name, whether it's Steve, John, Mark, Karen, whoever you are, written down and next to it say, in Christ? Of all the things that describe me, of all the things that mark me out, Steve Greedy, in Christ. Now the Apostle Paul really made that phrase, in Christ, his own. In telling his own story of how he became to understand who Jesus was and why he came. Up to that point in his life, he disregarded Jesus in a pretty remarkable way. That's just evident from the story when you read it. But when he came to discover the wonder of Jesus' work and he was placed in Christ, he said quite memorably in writing to uh, the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. In other words, something had happened to, this, to change this individual. Their lives, if written down, would have been in two volumes. Volume one, pre-Christ. Disregarding him, knowing him, but not yet knowing, sorry, knowing of him, but not yet knowing him. And then coming to know him. And then in volume two, in Christ. Now with that in mind, we read what is one of the loveliest invitations in the New Testament. It comes at the final three verses of the passage that we read. The source of the invitation is Jesus Christ himself. It is Jesus that is speaking, first to his Father in prayer, then concerning the nature of the Father's revealing of the Son. And then he issues this invitation. And the invitation is, you noted, it's comprehensive. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened. This is not just a call to a certain group of people, but it's aimed at the whole of humanity. The source of the invitation is Jesus. The scope of the, universe, uh, of the invitation is universal. The significance of the invitation concerns the fact that Jesus is inviting these people to find rest for your soul. Not simply to have a break from the troubles and cares, not simply to find something uh, that will make their life a little bit more bearable, but he speaks in eternal terms. He's speaking in a way that involves the totality of human existence. He's speaking in a way that addresses the big questions in life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? And does that even matter? All these questions are sensible that any sensible man or woman will find themselves asking at some time or another. And it's all wrapped up in this invitation. This is not an invitation to be set aside. It must be given top priority. It demands our attention and it calls for immediate action. And when you want to know what that requires, look at the action words, look at the verbs. There's four of them. Wrong one, that one. Oh, sorry, I'll go back. Don't worry, it's not, not the one I wanted. It's back at the end of the uh, chapter we read. Um, 
You've got the four, ver four verbs. You've got come in verse 28, take in verse 29, learn in verse 29, and find in verse 29. First of all, the invitation is to come and come to me. Jesus is calling, come to me, he says. Now, this is a person-to-person -person invitation. Now, only those of a certain age, only those of a certain vintage will have any idea of the phrase person-to-person. -person. Uh, back in the old days, before we all had mobile phones and 24-hour communication, to speak to somebody, you'd have to make a telephone call. And by using an operator, they would connect to the other person by using cables in the telephone exchange. If the operator was unable to get the other person on the other end of the line, you didn't have to pay for the telephone call. Now, this invitation is both generic and specific. It's an invitation that is made by a person to persons, and it may be personalized by all those who hear it and all those that listen to it. It's not an invitation to a scheme. It's not an invitation to a philosophy, but it's an invitation to and by Jesus himself. And he introduces himself as being gentle and humble in heart. And instead of commanding us, he begs our response. Come to me, he says. I want you to come to me. Now we need to be clear who it is who is issuing this invitation. In Luke 4, yeah, in Luke 4, we have the account of Jesus returning to Galilee and going to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And starting at verse 16, he says, So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened it, uh, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at his gracious words, which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? Now these words were well known to those attending the synagogue. He was uh, reading for the, from the familiar prophetic words that had come out the scroll of Isaiah. And after reading, it was customary for somebody to sit down in the place of the teacher. And Luke tells us that once the scroll had been removed from him and placed in its position, he sat down in the place of the rabbi, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were on him. He's in his own town. He's returned as the homeboy to Nazareth. He's back amongst the people who would know him, those who went shopping with his mother, those who had children of the same age and grew up with Jesus, those who knew him as the boy from the carpenter shop. He has returned He's in his hometown synagogue and everyone was fixed on him to hear what he would say and what words would come out of his mouth. And none of them would have anticipated what he said next. He said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness and marveled at his gracious words that proceed out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Isn't this the boy from the carpenter's shop? Now do I understand exactly what's going on here? He's returned to read the prophetic scriptures describing the coming of the Messiah who, has a, who will establish the kingdom of God. He's just read all that. And did I hear him correctly? Did he say, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing? Is he suggesting that he is none other than the Messiah? Yes, he is. We have a story to tell of a savior, of a Lord, of a king. We don't have an alternative option to offer people, one that can be included with Islam, with Buddhism, with New Ageism, with Selfism, along with all the other religions and ideas that make up 21st century deities. No, it's the identity of the one who issued the invitation that gives significance to this invitation. This is not to be set aside. It's a priority to attend to. This invite is from Jesus to all who are weary and burdened. Well, that's fine, you may say. That lets me off the hook because I'm neither. I'm neither weary nor burdened. You can just sit back and switch off and ignore all the rest of this because it doesn't concern me because I'm strong and carefree. 
really. I love to meet someone strong and carefree. I haven't met a single person who isn't pushing a wheelbarrow uphill full of all the cares and responsibilities and fears and failures that make up his or her life. Imagine the scenario of going to the doctors for a checkup. You turn up on time, sit there in the doctor's waiting room for the nurse to come in. She wraps that rubber band around your arm, uh, whichever could produce the best vein, and they do the routine blood work, and you have an MRI scan. Later in the day, you're at home sitting there as though you're fine, fit as a fiddle, being called by the doctor and told that despite all the appearances to the contrary, you are significantly unwell. Now, when you walked in, you had no idea of your condition. None of your friends would ever have thought of it or considered it. They seen you running that morning, riding your bike only two weeks earlier. But now everything is different. The result of blood work, the result of the MRI, revealing the true circumstances that are unseen from the outside. That's what the Bible does. The Bible provides an MRI scan. It investigates at the very core of your being. And it points out that those who believe they have the world by their tail, those who are strong and carefree, that in actual fact, things are not the way they assume. That when it comes to the issues of our souls, the Bible makes it very, very clear that we are suffering from a terminal illness. And that terminal illness is sin. Now, most people think that the issue is not about our sins, plural, the things that we do or haven't done. So they say, well, I haven't done a lot lately. If I haven't done really as much as somebody else, then they say to themselves, you know, sin's not that big of an issue for me. In fact, you're right. Sins are not that big an issue for you. The issue is your sin, because sin is what has separated us from God. And the Bible says that all have sinned and are separated from God. All of us have fallen short of the standard that God has established. That is perfection. None of us ever will live to perfection. And in the words of Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us, no exceptions, has turned to his own way. In other words, we've got a dilemma. We're unfit for heaven and we're unable to rectify that fact. Suddenly, into our biographies of life, we have to write, if we're honest, according to the Bible, I am by nature unfit for heaven and unable to rectify my situation. That's a bit of a burden. Now, there are two ways that people reject this invitation. Two ways they reject Jesus as Savior. By being as bad as possible and breaking all the rules, or by being as good as possible and keeping all the rules. These are the only two ways you'll find yourself saying no to this invitation of Jesus. If you've been so bad and broken all the rules, you say, there's no hope for me, and you're wrong. If you've been so good and done it all and kept it all, and you say to yourself, well, there's no need for me, and you'd be wrong. The invitation is clear, and the significance is undeniable. Second word we come to is take. Take my yoke upon you. Now, the yoke is a wooden frame placed across the back of cattle uh, for fastening them together. It's also the wooden frame where you carry two buckets, one on either side, and the yoke is designed to spread the load evenly across both shoulders. So with that in mind, the scripture picture that, the, the picture that Jesus t uh, talks about here is, I want you to take my yoke upon you. Jesus was separating himself and the message from the story that these Jewish people have been given by the religious leaders of the day particularly the Pharisees. They were the individuals who were meticulous in their desire to do what was right. And in fact, they were so consumed by it that when they finished with all the things that God had told them to do, they then, then added a shovel full of their own. So they made it virtually impossible for anyone to be able to do anything. And in the end, man might only be accepted by God on the strength of these external commitments was absolutely crushing. In the same way that those brought up in a religious background that had mainly been a set of stories saying, come on now, you can do this. Come on now, try a little harder. Come on now, this is just there for you to achieve. That would wear the neck of any thinking person. And that's not, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, take my yoke upon you. Be under the yoke and authority of Jesus is not a burden. It's a delight. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Free in order to become the very bond slave of Jesus. Free not to do what I want to do, but free to do what I should. 
since by nature I cannot do what I should because I'm in bondage to my own desires, I need someone to set me free in order that I might live in obedience to his will. Jesus is Lord. That's not just an expression of personal devotion. That's a statement of fact concerning Jesus' identity. And because he is Lord, to come to him, to respond to the invitation, is to take on a responsibility, a freeing responsibility, but a responsibility nonetheless. And since Jesus is Lord, those who have come to Jesus and live under his yoke have no freedom to behave in any other way than that which the way Jesus as Lord declares. So the issues of morality, the issues, issues of sexuality, the conducting of business, the practice of family, all these things are gathered here together under the yoke of Jesus. Paul summarizes it in 1 Corinthians 1 60, or 1 6, he says, You are not your own. That is the one here, sorry. Uh, you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our third point, learn. Come, take, learn. Have you ever listened to children when they come back from school? Listen to the things that said by the parents and the grandparents who are there to collect them. As they come towards them, the question is, did you have fun today? But the question should be, did you learn anything today? That's why they went to school, to learn. Now, sadly, there are some churches where that same question wouldn't fill out a place. When it's all over, to be asked, did you have fun today? Brothers and sisters, that's not the question. The question should be, did you learn anything? Well, if you want to learn, presumably you'd have a Bible. And if, you've ha if you have a Bible, presumably you would open it. And if you opened it, presumably you would look inside to see what if the person behind this box was actually saying was written down in that book. If not, I'd be very concerned if I was you. Very concerned. Christianity changes the way a man or woman thinks, hence the invitation to learn. There's a great quote by C.S. Lewis when he says, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the rising of the sun, not simply because I can see it, but because by it I can see everything else. Coming to Jesus changes everything, changes the way I view everything, changes my perspective on Jesus, changes my perspective on time, changes my perspective on career. It changes everything. As we learn from him, as we study the scriptures, we learn that our acceptance with God is because of the fact that Jesus has lived the kind of life that I should live but can't, and that he paid the, uh, the, paid the penalty that I deserve for the kind of life I do live, but I shouldn't. That's the gospel. This is not a gospel of the story of the fears that attach to rejecting the benefits of the gospel, or those that accept it. Many people have heard about what happens if we don't accept the gospel, or the benefits that we may enjoy if we do accept the gospel. But others are saying, I wish somebody would just tell me the gospel. That Christ died once for all. The righteous, that's him. For the unrighteous, that's me. To bring me to God. He who is without sin became sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What I'm saying is that all the blessings of God are made available to us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And simply a head knowledge of that is not to be compared with believing in it, in trusting in it, in learning of it, and to be yoked by it for ourselves. Is this speaking to you this morning? I pray that God would extend to you the invitation of Jesus. It would be for somebody trying to unscramble the riddle of their lives, putting the jigsaw pieces back together as best they can, and finding no matter how much they try, they can't get it to match the picture on the box. You just can't get there. Why don't you come then and respond to this invitation? Come, take this yoke, learn from this Christ, and finally find. Find rest for your souls. For your souls, there's a concept. Have you noticed recently, well, over the last 30 or 40 years, that Western culture has become preoccupied with spirituality, while at the same time rejecting the notion that our souls as an eternity as an entity, sorry, will go on beyond us as we shuffle off this mortal coil. Traditionally, spirituality was used in the early church to refer to a life focused on and toward the Holy Spirit. However, 
that term today has now spread to other religions and other, uh, a, a wider range of experiences. Spirituality is a, con is a broad concept which allows many views and opinions, but it generally includes a sense of connection to something bigger than ourselves and typically involves a search for a meaning in life. There's a quote that can be traced back to Augustine of Hippo, uh, Bishop of North Africa around 400 AD, and he says that inside each and every one of us is a hole, a God-shaped hole, a hole that we strive to fill by various means. None of us, none of them are any good for us or satisfies that yearning that still remains within us. These spiritual experiences are described as sacred or inspiring or simply a deep sense of, uh, of aliveness or togetherness. Some find the spiritual life linked to a church. Others may pray. Others may find comfort in a personal relationship with a higher power. It is through that, through seeking your connection with something bigger that your, than yourself, you can have positive emotions, such as peace, contentment, gratitude, acceptance. But your personal definition of spirituality may also change throughout your own life, changing with experiences, changing with relationships. But one element is missing from this viewpoint of spirituality, and that's the most important point, is the notion of eternity. The concept that the Bible makes so perfectly clear that death is not the end, that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this comes judgment. A judgment that will be absolutely fair, and a judgment that will be absolutely final. An inescapable appointment towards which each and every one of us moves. That's why this invitation is so important, because it's the only way that anyone may ever find rest for your soul. Remember when Jesus told the parable of the man who'd done so well in business? It wasn't a criticism of doing well in business, and he decided that he would be a good idea to develop his holdings, build bigger barns for all the, big, all the extra grain that he'd had. The problem wasn't that either. That was a valid thing to do. What made the situation so pitiful? One thing that he left out, that vital piece, Jesus said to him, well, you know, that's really foolish because tonight your soul will be required of you. Where do your priorities lie? What drives you in life? Paul said again in Philipp, uh, Philipp, uh, Philippians uh, 1.21, he says, when he's summarizing his own Christian journey, he says, to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the only way that equation works. Just try any other word you can think of, place it next to, to die is gain. Try success. To me, to live is success. To die is not gain. To me, to live is money. And to, me, and to die is not gain. Or to me, to live is preoccupation with family. To die is not gain. There's only way you can complete that, that equation. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul's focus was on Jesus and him crucified. The only thing better than that was to die and join him for eternity in heaven. As we end tonight, this is the invitation you have to accept. But the world's response, don't come to me with your invitation, I'm fine, thank you very much. But for those who recognise that life is frail, can join with John Newton when he wrote... Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all the boasted pomp and show, that solid joy, that lasting treasure is found in Jesus. Here then is that loveliest of invitations. Come to me, to Jesus. I'm humble, I'm gentle, I'm approachable. Your problem was so severe that I had to die on the cross for you. But I love you so much that I was willing to die on the cross to you, for you. Come to me, he says. Now, when you get an invitation to a party, whether it's a wedding or a social event, the question often arises, what are we supposed to wear? Every so often, someone will say, I don't want to go to that because I've got nothing to wear anyway. But this invitation from Jesus, just go to the banquet just the way you are because clothes are provided. He takes all the, I'm so good I don't need this clothes, which are rags and disrobes us. He takes all the, I'm so bad and messed up and there's no hope clothes, which are rags and disrobes us. And he covers us with a robe of righteousness provided by Jesus Christ himself. And we're able to sing, just as I am, without one plea, but that thou blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me.
come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. We made it all so complicated, as if somehow by another our intellect can find us a way back to God. There is no intellectual roads to God. The only way we can know him is because God has chosen to make himself known. That was also part of the reading. I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Not that we would become childish in our outlook, but that we might become childlike in our faith. Let's just bow our heads. Father God, when I examine my own life, I admit that I am weaker and more sinful than I ever before believed. But through Jesus Christ, I am more loved and accepted than I ever dared hope. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for paying my debt, bearing my punishment and offering me forgiveness and for being my saviour. Amen to the glory of God. Amen.